Hi, welcome back to Engage and Empower Me, a patient engagement design class from the Stanford University School of Medicine. Uh, I am Dr. Larry Chu. I am co-director of this class along with Dr. Kyra Babinette from the Stanford Persuasive Technology Lab. It is exciting to uh, welcome you back online, and for those of you joining us in person who have been to previous classes, welcome back. Uh, as you know, this is a quarter-long class where we're going to have conversations and discussions about the topic of patient engagement. Uh, and I'm super excited today to have two great speakers with us. Uh, we have with us today Brett Alder, a Stanford Medicine X 2013 ePatient Scholar. Uh, who's going to share his story of patient engagement. And we're going to follow that talk uh, after a short break with um, Susanna Fox from the Pew Internet American Life Project. And she's going to uh, talk with us about participatory research. So before we get started and uh, before we get Brett up here, we're going to take a quick break to give a message to those of you watching us online. And then after that break, come back in a minute and we'll be ready with uh, Brett's talk. See you in a little bit. If you're joining us for the first time, a quick reminder that there is a simultaneous conversation happening on Twitter right now using the hashtag MedX. In today's class, we'll be taking questions from social media, so please make sure to start up your Twitter client to join in the online conversation and interact with today's speaker. Sarah Kucharski, otherwise known as Afternoon Napper, is moderating the online tweet chat discussion tonight. Please note, you are watching a live online program, and there is a delay between real-time events and the live stream that you are watching. Tweets from our in-class guests will appear before you see the real-time events they are tweeting about unfold on the live stream video. We'd also like to take this opportunity to remind you that Call for Abstracts and Presenters is now open for Stanford Medicine X 2014. Don't miss your chance to present at the premier patient-centered conference on emerging technology and medicine. Applications for speakers and presenters are now open until March 1st, 2014. For more information, go to medicinex.stanford.edu and apply today. I never dreamed of becoming a patient when I grew up. <clears throat> At age 24, life was great. I had recently given a commencement speech at my college after graduating, and one week later married my college sweetheart. That's when I started to get sick. After being ill for a month, we were bewildered. <clears throat> after three months, my muscles and nerves were so damaged that I could no longer lift weights, play the guitar, or use a mouse. At six months, I was experiencing chronic pain and fatigue. <clears throat> did, I, did I pick up some strange bug while we were honeymooning in Mexico? The only other major thing that had changed was that I had become sexually active upon getting married. My symptoms did seem to get worse right after sex. <clears throat> Could my new lifestyle be making me ill? Neither of us had ever heard of such a thing and neither had Google. <laughs> sure enough, as we moderated sexual activity, I began to feel better, and we found that I would be sick for about seven days after sex, with the main symptoms being brain fog, sore muscles, and extreme fatigue. <clears throat> Eventually, I took my case to a general practitioner who pretended like he hadn't heard me. A rheumatologist gave me only the vague diagnosis of myalgia, and another specialist told me that my condition didn't make sense. <clears throat> Many years later, I came across a Dutch research paper indicating that sufferers were allergic to their own semen. And two patients were successfully treated by receiving diluted injections to desensitize their immune systems. <clears throat> and that's when I discovered the name of my condition. Post Orgasmic Illness Syndrome. A fine name. <clears throat> I rushed to get tested by an allergist <clears throat> and had the same inflammatory response to the intradermal injection that I normally did to sex. 
But my allergist was looking for a skin reaction, which I didn't have. He declined to treat me, and I determined to treat myself. And thanks to the support of my fellow sufferers, after two years, my wife now feels like she's uh, starring in a Vi Viagra commercial. <laughs> <clears throat> but why didn't the medical system, she didn't want me to say that, but why didn't the medical system, why didn't the medical system work for me? <clears throat> it seemed that my opinion alone carried no weight. In sales, there's this best practice that you should always identify the decision maker. If you keep that person happy, there's a good chance you'll win the sale. And many of us are used to being decision makers. As a cell phone consumer, you decide pretty much everything the wireless carrier, the data plan, what type of phone to buy, and the apps and music to download. I looked at my situation as a patient and realized that my doctor didn't see me as a decision maker. As much as he wanted to help, could he expect to be paid more for researching my undiscovered condition? I don't know. I don't control how much he gets paid. Is my insurance company motivated to reimburse for things that I want, like this experimental therapy? Not really. I didn't choose my insurance company. My employer did. As a patient, I'm not the main decision maker. So as we go from internet user or cell phone consumer to patient, we go from having a lot of decision making power to having quite little. Interesting, I have so little control over something as important to me as my health. <clears throat> So in my opinion, empowering patients means treating us like decision makers. And doing so makes you view the world a little differently. For example, if you're trying to decide what new restaurant to try, or are looking for a clean place to stay in New York City, it's helpful to learn from the experiences of others through simple five-star ratings and helpful reviews. <clears throat> I wish I had such a tool so I could see what was working for other people all of those years, I was trying treatment after treatment, which is why I co-founded a small company to do just that. It may not be scientific, but it will provide additional insights for patients who have important decisions to make. And along the way, we can't help but dream of a healthcare system that every year gets better, faster, smarter, cheaper, where the needs of patients truly are first and foremost. Thank you. If you're joining us for the first time, a quick reminder that there is a simultaneous conversation happening on Twitter right now using the hashtag MedX. In today's class, we'll be taking questions from social media, so please make sure to start up your Twitter client to join in the online conversation and interact with today's speaker. Sarah Kucharski, otherwise known as Afternoon Napper, is moderating the online tweet chat discussion tonight. Okay. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Susanna Fox, who will be our main speaker tonight. Susanna is an associate director at, the Pew, Re at Pew Research and the American Life Project. Self-described as healthcare gadfly, internet geologist, and community colleague. I would like to add to that the title of conversation starter. <clears throat> Susanna inspires all of us with her interest in patients and caregivers and by sharing that information far and wide. Thank you. And I'll take the clicker. You bet. Here you go. Thank you. So a lot of what this class is about is change, either creating change or noticing change. Um, and so I started to think about the question that could frame what I'm going to talk about tonight. And that is, how does change happen? How do political systems change? How do business practices change? And how do cultural practices change? Um, and I think it's a good way to think about it in terms of healthcare, since healthcare, a lot of healthcare is um, cultural practice, this cultural practice that Brett described. Um, that we don't treat the patient um, as if they are a decision maker. And also, frankly, healthcare is a business. And so we're talking about changing business practices. Um, 
And what I would like to do is to describe the way that I see change happening in the field that I pay the most attention to, which is research, so that you can start to recognize how change happens in your field and in your life, um, and maybe give you some tools that you can use later. Um, so it's been my observation, backed up by some reading that I've done, that systems change in four stages. The first is the failure of an existing model, the emergence of a successful model, the participation of people affected by the system, and the adoption of a new model by powerful entities. And sometimes that happens after a revolution. Um, recognizing change it is what motivates me to be a student of participation. And when I think about participation, I think about participatory democracy participatory medicine, and participatory research. Um, so I'm going to first talk about some failed or failing models. And I'm going to begin by asking you to, if you can, if you can remember, um, or if you can imagine back to the 90s when very few people had access to the internet. It was really limited to alpha geeks and universities. And um, at that time, um, people still were looking things up in books that were printed on paper. Um, and information really wasn't free. And um, in those olden days, um, there was an anthropologist named Diana Forsyth um, who um, conducted fieldwork in an artificial intelligence lab that was tasked with creating an information kiosk for newly diagnosed migraine patients. And um, essentially, it was going to be a big box with a screen that would sit in the waiting room of a doctor's office. And a patient could go up to it and type in questions and um, maybe prepare for a doctor's appointment by getting their questions answered. And in a lot of ways, this idea was ahead of its time. It was really pre-internet. And it was, um, it was a nice idea. Um, and so um, when it launched, unfortunately, it was a complete failure. Um, Patients would use it once and never use it again. And um, the kiosk's designers had not asked patients what they wanted to know about migraine. They relied on the interview of a single doctor who told them what he thought patients should want to know. And so I like to imagine these artificial intelligence product designers with the clipboard you know, holding the clipboard, interviewing that one doctor. Um, and um, as Forsyth wrote, the research team simply assumed that what patients wanted to know about migraine was what neurologists want to explain. And of course, the mismatch was complete. The kiosk failed to answer the number one question of people newly diagnosed with migraine, which is, am I going to die from this pain? And that question is, um, you know, could be seen really as, a, as an irrelevant question to a neurologist. Of course, you're not going to die from migraine. Um, but it's a secret question that a lot of people have when they are first diagnosed with something. And we should honor that. We should honor that people have that question um, instead of pushing it away and saying, How, why would you even ask that question? And it's a question that people might ask a kiosk. And now we ask that anonymous search box on Google um, because we can feel free to ask Google things that we maybe aren't comfortable asking another person. So contrast that approach with the approach of probably the premier product design firm in the country, Procter & Gamble. I was lucky enough to be in the room a few years ago when the head of global research for Procter & Gamble was advising White House officials on how to change the way they communicate about HIV. And he told about how the Procter & Gamble research team had slashed its budget um, in terms of survey and focus groups. And they have a new mantra, and that is to listen more than ask. They listen on social media and therefore are able to hear how people talk about their products in people's own context in their own lives. And in that way, Procter & Gamble can truly understand how, what people really think instead of this artificial situation where 
they're answering questions or in a focus group. Um, and um, so it makes me think again about this, this idea of a clipboard, that if Procter & Gamble can put down the clipboard, then why can't we? So this is what I would ask you to do, to start to think about ways that you can open up, ways that you can put down the clipboard and start to let people tell you what they really think. Um, and now I'm going to tell you about another a failing model, um, and that is uh, telephone survey research. Um, it's really, again, the ultimate I have the clipboard methodology, where you're interrupted during dinner, and they try to keep you on the phone for 20 minutes, and they don't tell you what the questions are going to be, and you are limited to saying yes, no, agree, disagree. Um, and for 50 years, the research industry has relied on this methodology to, um, to get an accurate snapshot of people's attitudes and opinions and behaviors. The Pew Research Center, which is where I work, is one of the gold standard industries, um, gold standing, standard organizations in this industry. And my colleagues in the political research division pride themselves on being able to call the outcome of the presidential election. And it's, it's like a magic trick that they pull off every four years. And um, there's a lot of competition in the survey industry. Um, to, to be the, the organization that can call it to within a tenth of a percentage point. And they do it every time. And, and we love that in a way. We love looking at the horse race of the presidential election. It gets a lot of coverage and people really count on us to do that counting. But we have a significant problem. And that is that response rates are diving. <laughs> We're in a situation where in 1997, we had 36% response rate. So you can see the, the contact rate, the, cooper the cooperation rate, and then the response rate. We're now down to 9%. 9% response rate in the United States. And that's across the board. That's not just the Pew Research Center. That's everybody. Frankly, we are starting to lose the signal. And the research industry is quietly panicking. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> um, and we, we're facing a situation where um, you know, a lot of people are mobile only. Um, they don't have a landline. Um, and people are less likely to pick up the call from just a random number on their mobile phone. And now a lot of people also have caller ID. Once we get them on the phone, fewer and fewer people are willing to actually stay on the line and answer our questions. Um, and we've been sort of hanging on for a long time until this last methodology survey, which found not only do we have a problem with the response rate, but the people who are actually willing to answer our questions are demographically and politically different from people who are not willing to answer the questions. And that is a fatal flaw. If we can't predict based on you know, interviews with 1,000 people what the outcome, what the truth is, then we really, really have a serious problem with telephone survey research. But we've noticed something really intriguing at the Pew Research Center in the last year. We started putting short versions of our questionnaires on our website um, and letting people kind of take the survey on their own. And at the end of it, they would get to match up you know, what their knowledge of science is against the rest of the country or their knowledge of news or the political situation. Um, Millions and millions of people are taking our quizzes. They're a runaway success. And I think that there's something to learn from that. Because let's think about what is the difference when you get um, called on your phone during dinner or driving or wherever you are, the person who's trying to get you to take the survey, again, is holding the clipboard and not letting you see any of the questions. And they're not giving you anything for participating in the survey. Whereas when you take it online, you get something. You learn something about yourself, even as we learn from you what your opinion is or what your knowledge of science or news is. We allow people to participate, and they come back for more. People will take quiz after quiz after quiz. So I think there's something there. Um, so now I've talked about two failed or failing models and a couple of emerging models, possibilities um, for, for what could happen next. 
Um, so now I want to talk a little bit more about the emerging, emerging models and talk about how it relates to healthcare specifically. Um, the migraine kiosk story was shared with me by my mentor, Tom Ferguson. Um, he was an MD who believed in the power of listening to patients um, and giving people access to information. I um, had studied the anthropology, and so I understood the tools that you use as a participant observer. And I understood that um, you had to look at the context of people's lives to really understand what's going on. Um, but it was Tom who helped me really put it into practice as a researcher in 2002. We fielded an on, a 20 question online survey um, and invited people from three online patient and caregiver communities to participate. Uh, 1,971 people responded. And they spent a lot of time writing short answers and essays to the 20 questions that we had on the survey. Frankly, it was incredibly labor intensive work to analyze that data. Um, I spent hours and hours reading people's answers and essays and following the patterns in what they were talking about. And I did follow up interviews with 19 people. By contrast, telephone survey results are very clean and orderly and anonymous um, and relatively easy to interpret. Um, and there's a quote that I think really captures the beauty of statistics, but also what's not so beautiful about them. Um, Sir Austin Bradford Hill said, health statistics represent people with the tears wiped off. And before I met Tom, that's what I spent my working days doing, looking at statistics, adding columns to 100, um, and telling clean, orderly stories. So this is my walking gallery jacket. Um, and it was painted by an artist named Regina Holliday. Um, and you may, if you go to healthcare conferences, especially Medicine X, you'll see other people wearing these jackets. And she started painting them so that people um, wearing business attire at a healthcare conference would have their personal patient story painted on the back. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit about what's going on in my painting. That's me giving a speech, I'm behind the screen. Um, and this um, is what she called a data moat. Um, and I'll put up the slides so you can see a little bit more of the detail. Um, Regina painted the, the data moat standing um, a little bit sadly, a little bit downcast. They're, they've been anonymized. Um, you can't tell whether it's a man or a woman. Um, they're standing in the sunlight because statistics do shed light. And you'll notice there's a cloud um, because data often does live up in the cloud. Um, but their hand is on the screen. Um, and they seem to be maybe wanting to talk to me. But I'm, I'm behind the screen. I, um, I'm not able to say what I really think. I'm just speaking through my data. Um, and frankly, it's, it's a very clean and orderly painting. Um, but it's also a little bit sad because of the anonymity, because frankly of the tears wiped off of that data. Um, and again, I'm hiding a little bit. I'm hiding a little bit of my humanity behind the screen. But what I realized after working with Tom is that there was no turning back. If I wanted to be a researcher who stayed ahead of this emerging field of healthcare and social media and technology, then I had to be open. I had to be more human. Um, and what I found is that I had to give up the clipboard sometimes um, and let people just tell me what they wanted to share uh, in their own words. And I had to put respondents at the center of the research. I had to listen more than ask. Um, I learned that I have to do much of my fieldwork analysis at home where I can cry, frankly. Anyone who works in healthcare will tell you the same thing, I think, and that is if you go into the field of healthcare, you're gonna cry. Um, but there's no other way to go if you want to get at the truth. And that's my mission as a researcher. 
and that is to tell the truth. Um, I use fieldwork to look for patterns among the patients and caregivers that I follow and that I'm friends with online, asking for their help when I'm choosing new topics to research. Um, and being a participant observer in the world of healthcare social media, I stay ahead of the field. And I'd be happy in the uh, Q&A to tell you about some examples of that. Um, but on to the third part of the successful change, um, and that is participation by the people affected by the system. Um, and I'm going to pause to quote um, Pete Seeger, um, the folk singer and activist who recently passed away. And he said in one of his last public appearances, I've never sung anywhere without giving, people, um, giving the people listening to me a chance to join in. I guess it's kind of a religion with me, participation. And that's what's going to save the human race. And um, I love that quote because it reminds me of, of Tom. It reminds me of Tom Ferguson, who was my mentor. Um, and he amazingly started writing about the internet's potential for healthcare back in 1987. He was a visionary. Um, he coined the word e-patients to describe people who are enabled, empowered, engaged, um, equipped. And um, the E can also stand for electronic, meaning online. Um, and when Tom was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, a rare form of cancer, he put those principles to work on his own behalf. Um, he lived in Austin, Texas, but um, his networking led him to seek treatment in Little Rock at uh, the Myeloma Institute for Research and Therapy, or MERT, at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. And even as Tom went through chemotherapy, he was devising a plan for um, increased patient feedback at the hospital where he was being treated. Um, they set up a system to collect the confidential feedback from patients. Um, they created note cards that you could put into a box, a suggestion box. Um, and they made immediate changes to the, the pain points that they identified, um, wait times at the clinic and at the pharmacy. Um, staffers weren't happy when they started getting this uh, very specific feedback from the patients. Um, but Tom had a plan. He um, devised and funded with his own money um, a reward system so that when a card came in with a specific uh, compliment for a staffer, that compliment would um, get a monetary reward, a gift certificate. Um, and then because of that, people were more eager to embrace the change because not only were pain points recognized, but good things were recognized as well. Unfortunately, Tom uh, died in 2006 from complications related to his cancer treatment. But his uh, doctor, Elias Anasi, uh, carried on with the initiative, eventually helping to create a participatory care model that's been embraced by patients, caregivers, and clinicians. And um, Tom's humility really infuses the approach. It places patients at the center, asking them how they would like to receive treatment instead of allowing clinicians to choose based on their own preferences and assumptions. And the great news is that this has actually improved clinical outcomes. So it's not just making people feel good, it's actually improving their outcomes, the way that they approach it there. Um, but just as important are the improvements to the quality of life enjoyed by the patients who are treated in Little Rock for multiple myeloma. The following story is from a journal article about this new care model from the Journal of Participatory Medicine. And I'm going to read it because um, I want to make sure that I get it right. It's a great story. A 40-year-old male from Illinois was diagnosed with multiple myeloma in May 2005 and referred himself to MERT in August 2008 because his disease was no longer responding to the treatment he was receiving in his hometown and had metastasized to the liver a very ominous sign usually associated with short survival. He moved to Little Rock with his wife and their four-year-old son to undergo multiple myeloma treatment with the express desire to be treated as an outpatient because he wanted to spend as much quality time with his young son as possible. The patient responded well to therapy for more than two years during which he actively participated in raising his son, playing their favorite game of baseball together. By early 2011, the patient's multiple myeloma became less responsive to therapy, and he died on the inpatient service in late April 2011. 
Two days before his death, the patient expressed his desire to watch his son's baseball game because the boy had told him, Dad, I want to hit a good one for you. The medical team made special provisions to honor his request so he could experience his son's excitement when he did indeed score one for him. Tom Ferguson's legacy is that he recognized the humanity in medicine. And I truly believe that he has taught us all how to be a little bit more human, and we're all the better for it. And uh, it's his approach that I feel that even now I'm just growing into. I'm growing into his vision of what a researcher could really be. Um, and I'm still following in the footsteps that he, that he took on his path. Um, Tom knew that clinicians would never have all the answers. Um, instead, he showed clinicians how to honor people's questions and encourage patients and caregivers to keep asking questions. And um, in 2002, when Tom and I were working on that very first project together, he said that we should have a text box next to every single question, even the ones that were just asking really basic information, you know, the, the very typical yes, no, what's your age, that kind of thing. He wanted people to feel like they could push back on every single question in the survey or add more if they really felt like they, they needed to add more than just a, a checkbox. Um, he also advised me to make the last question as open as possible and to not have a, a word count limit at all on the box. And the question was essentially, is there anything else you'd like to share? And not surprisingly, the insights that we got from that question were more important than any of the other questions that we asked in the survey. Any of the other questions that I, with my clipboard, was so confident that I knew the question to ask. And in fact, of course, the most important thing was just to ask the patients and caregivers what they wanted to share with us. Um, so what I will leave you with now is my advice, again, to when you have the chance, listen, to, to put down the clipboard whether you are going to go into research, whether you're going to go into engineering, whether you're, whether you're working um, in, in medicine or any other field, put down the clipboard and listen to people. And also, when you have a chance, ask, is there anything else you'd like to share? Um, I've put together a Storify that has all of the research that I've done about participatory research. Um, and. Um, there's articles from expert organizations like IDEO. Um, there's some amazing work that's being done with giving people cameras um, and allowing them to just take pictures of their experience because you can learn so much from the visual record. Um, but really, I would just invite you to join me on the path that Tom Ferguson set us all on. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Susanna. <clears throat> We'd like to give a special shout out to those of you who are joining us on Twitter, Meredith Gold and Aaron Moore. Thank you for joining us. <clears throat> and here we go. And if you're joining us for the first time, a quick reminder that there is a simultaneous conversation happening on Twitter. If you'd like to join the conversation, use, please use the hashtag MedX. Hugo Campos, otherwise known as at Hugo OC, is moderating the online tweet chat discussion tonight. And, um, and I will be moderating a discussion with Susanna Fox. We'll be taking questions through Twitter and from the class live. So uh, please post your questions to hashtag MedX. And so we'd like to start by taking a question from the class. And if you don't take the opportunity, I will, because I'd love to talk with Susanna here. <laughs> Yes, Rose. Um, I'm curious, as you moved away from cleaner um, surveys um, that are more uh, easily dissectable and analyzable, um, have you 
developed any techniques to identify patterns in the richer um, feedback that you're getting that can be much more dense and complex? Thank you. So the, the question for those who might not have heard is, um, as I've, I've moved away from just doing the clean orderly survey research, what are the techniques that I use to look for patterns? Um, what I find is that um, I've looked, the, the most recent in-depth field work that I've done is um, in communities of people living with rare disease. And um, when we look at um, these rare disease communities, these are um, diseases that you probably have never heard of. Um, that, um, and, and what's amazing about it is to see, is, is when you go down deep into a, into a certain condition, um, you would think that it wouldn't have much to do with this other condition. Um, and then you go into a third and a fourth and a fifth. And what you do see is that there is a pattern across all of them. And I, w I honestly wouldn't say that, that I have necessarily a technique besides um, when I do field work, I, I take a couple of months and do it in depth and take that investment of time in order to um, be able to look for the patterns. Um, it's field work is not something that you can just do in 20 minutes around the margins. Like you, it turns out that you really have to invest in it. And, and so do you personally have to invest in it, getting to know the people that lead these communities then before you can kind of have access to? So that was one of the lessons of the first, um, the first time we fielded the, the 2002 project was um, that uh, we got an amazing response from two of the communities and almost no response from the third community. Hmm. And that's because in the first two communities, the very clear, almost messianic leader of the community, um, you know, the founding member of the community who's like the mayor of the city of this online city, they made a direct appeal and said, you should answer this survey. I believe in this project. Mm. And therefore, people went out of their way and wrote, you know, spent hours answering <laughs> our questions in depth. The, um, the, the third community turned out to be, um, it wasn't centralized. It didn't have a centralized website uh, or a centralized bulletin board. I'm really dating myself talking about BBSs. What, what's that? But, right? Um, old school. Um, and this was um, actually a, a whole series of tiny communities. And so instead of being able to reach out to one leader, we needed to reach out to all the leaders of the little communities. And mm. so for our next project, we reached out and did that. But indeed, you have to do a lot of work to gain trust in the community. Fantastic. We'd like to take another question from the class. Hi. Um, so earlier you were talking about uh, change and you know, institutional change. And one of the things, I'm an anthropologist, so I, oh, okay. I, I, yeah, I, I like deep data stories and things like that. But one thing that um, I think people like us maybe run into, especially in this area, is that um, what has been phrased as big data is like this like all-knowing, all-powerful, it's going to save everyone sort of thing. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any um, words, thoughts, case studies, um, about how that sort of big data can be, you know, kind of useful for, for the storytellers and the storytellers can really help people looking at that data make meaning out of it. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, so big data is the buzzword in, in the research community and a lot of communities. And it's seen as potentially a savior for this problem that we have where telephone survey research is, is going to die and we don't yet know what's necessarily going to replace it. Um, and so what we can learn, there's some things that we can learn from big data that, that are actually better. Um, so for example, a lot of the time that we've spent on telephone survey research about what do people look for online in terms of health information. Well, if we could get access to the search logs of Bing or Google or Yahoo or all of them, then we could actually just tell what people were searching for. So there's an example where big data is going to tell a better story than survey research. 
what an anthropologist would do is it, those, those in-depth interviews with somebody to really understand why they searched for something and what was the context for, for the search and to, to follow their path to see what they chose to click on. Um, and so it's, I think that the strongest study would be one that, that combines these. So, so uses the big data for pattern recognition and then does the field work to really understand the context of it. And, and just a follow-up question, do you have any success stories of taking that, uh, what I posted on your blog, putting that big data in skinny jeans, you know, <laughs> <laughs> which I stole from you. But anyway, do you have any uh, successful stories of going from big data to these insights that you're talking about? Um, not yet. Um, there's a lot of experimentation going on, um, and I'm really interested in whether there's going to be um, a possibility of using social media data, for example, hmm. to, to look at patterns, for example, in patient communities. Um, Twitter is still a small enough group. It's, it's really only 18% of the internet users in the US who use Twitter. And so um, we, we, there are a lot of people on Twitter who are in healthcare and who are e-patients but it's not yet necessarily a critical mass that, that we can make generalizations about the population. I see. Yeah, okay. stay tuned. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna do another couple of shout outs to Sherry Reynolds and Dr. Robert West for joining us on Twitter. Thank you, and please send your questions, a reminder to hashtag MedX. This next question is coming from Annette McKinnon for Susanna. Are you making progress with your research ideas? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, and I can't believe you're awake, because um, I think she's over in the UK. But um, so um, am I making progress? I, I, yes, I am, and thank you for the question. That's like a softball. Um, so a lot of what I'm really interested in these days is what, um, what we've come to call peer-to-peer -peer healthcare, which is a lot of what, of what you're working on as well. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, <clears throat> this idea that the most exciting innovation in healthcare right now um, is not an app. It's, it's not necessarily even anything that's specifically technology related. The most exciting innovation in healthcare is people talking with one another. Uh, it's people being able to connect with one another. And, um, and that is something that it's pretty hard to put a price on. It's pretty hard to have a startup. It's pretty hard to make that go public. But that's changing healthcare more than anything else that I see. Excellent. Just a couple more shout outs to Annie Valdez and Andrew Zimmerman for joining us on Twitter. Thank you for posting your questions. And we, uh, all our hands are up here, so we're going to try to field these. Um, <laughs> and we'd like to take another question from the class. Hi. Hey. It was a great talk. Um, do you see values in collecting and analyzing hashtags from Facebook and Twitter? Yeah, so the question is about whether we see value in, in collecting information, collecting the data of, of hashtags um, from Twitter and now from Facebook. Um, I think so. It's, it's something that, um, something I really like about Twitter is the ability to drop into a conversation that you can see by using a hashtag. Um, and I think um, there, there's, I've actually been working um, on a project sort of um, on the side, off the books, with Topsy um, that looks at how, what has been the conversation around Obamacare on Twitter um, and what can we learn from the conversation um, about Obamacare and looking at the sentiment analysis, has it been positive, negative? Um, Unfortunately, the, the failure of healthcare.gov, the website, dominated the conversation during the f initial rollout. But then some patterns emerged, which were really pretty interesting about how um, young people were um, talking about turning 26 as sort of a new rite of passage, that, you know, that when they have to get their own health care. <laughs> and um, you know, 21 is when you can start drinking, 26 is when you have to get your own health care. Um, and I think that, that, that there is a really neat opportunity to look at hashtags like the BCSM community, um, the MedEx community, and it's an opportunity just to drop down into something and also to gather people quickly if you can. 
um, I definitely think that, that there's some really interesting research to be done. Thank you. And we'd like to take another question from the class. Hi, Susanna. Hey. Hi. I'm a huge fan of yours and Dr. Ferguson and really inspired by the whole e-patient movement. I have a two-part question for you. Um, the first thing is, in all your research, I, I'm wondering if you're able to fit into skinny genes, like what were the main challenges that you see patients are facing? And the second part to the question is, we as healthcare providers, as doctors, nurses, who are time bound and statistically every minute of our time is analyzed, how can we be the implementers of the change that the patients need? Great question. So I feel like I need to explain to people why people keep bringing up skinny jeans. <laughs> uh, sorry, my bad. <laughs> um, so I um, gave a talk, um, uh, I guess it was a year ago now, based on some of the data that we had started to collect. And actually one of the examples of um, staying ahead of the field is that um, in the field work that I've done um, in rare disease and <coughs> cancer, HIV, um, mood disorders, all across the board, every community that I spent time in, people were doing self-tracking. And yet I did a literature review and found that nobody had ever done a national survey asking people if they're doing self-tracking. And I saw that a lot of the press coverage was about Fitbit and gadgets and things like that. And that's not really what I was seeing in the field work. So I saw this disconnect and I saw an opportunity for research. And so the Pew Research Center um, put together questions. Our first attempt, frankly, was not very good. We, we didn't ask very good questions. But then I invited people in to help me formulate the questions. And um, experts from all over the world helped me crowdsource the questions. Um, and we put together this great series that found that 7 out of 10 American adults are tracking their health in some way. But the catch is that fully half of them are only tracking in their heads. <laughs> now, some would say, does that count? Um, but I think it counts. And the reason that um, the, the, the example that I give is that um, I actually don't even own a scale. I don't own a Fitbit. I don't do any tracking. But I actually have a pair of skinny jeans. And if I can fit into my skinny jeans, <laughs> then I know that I'm at the right weight. I'm, I'm doing OK. And if I that's can't fit into my skinny jeans, maybe I need to make some changes. So that's why people keep referring to skinny jeans. But that's an example of allowing people into the participatory research process. So uh, I think that, um, I mean, I think the, the question about clinicians having so little time is a, is a really, really significant challenge. Um, and I think that um, this sense of um, the, the time challenge is one that I would just invite you to look at models like the one that was being done in Little Rock, like what's happening in Cincinnati, um, at Cincinnati Children's, the yeah. C3N project. They are working hard to figure out what is the platform for patient engagement. What um, you can only fit so much into that 10-minute clinical visit, but what about all the time that goes into the patient preparing for that visit, um, or all the time that, that um, happens after the clinical visit? And who are all the people who are surrounding that conversation that um, it might not even be the clinician that needs to have the, conversa you know, the next conversation. It might be the caregiver, the the daughter or um, you know, whoever it is in that person's life. So to, to, um, to open up the idea of, of when does that clinical conversation start and when does it end might be a way to open up um, the possibility. I, I can't, well, did I answer the first part of your question? I'm not sure I did. Um, what are some of the biggest problems that So some of the biggest problems that I see patients facing is um, well, it, you know, I think there's the people who are connected to each other who are the examples of the e-patients who have found each other, who have found a community, who have, who have found good things happening online. But then, just like there's only a small percentage of people who are using all the really cool Fitbit tracking tools and, 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 and tracking with a lot of clarity, there's this huge group of people who 
are, are left out of the conversation, who are not yet engaged. And I think that a lot could be done to get the word out about um, even just connecting with one other person, another, what I call the, the just-in-time someone like me, you know, someone who's just about to have the same surgery that you're about to have, or they just had it and you're about to have the same surgery, or someone who is, um, I heard a great story about um, it's in HIV that um, in HIV education, birth control education, that um, research was done which found that people really only want to get birth control and HIV information from someone who essentially is exactly like them. You know, so a gay man in the Bronx wants to hear from another gay man in the Bronx. You know, about what what they do, and the same thing with a you know a 16 year old girl in Des Moines wants to hear the challenges of another 16-year-old girl in Des Moines and what choices she's making. And so I think getting the word out about that possibility of using the internet to connect I, is one of the challenges that I see. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we've been informed that we had offended someone on Twitter. Um, <laughs> Dr. Meredith Gold would like to be referred to as doctor. So we are hereby banning her. We are no, no longer shouting out to Dr. Gold. <laughs> She's offended. Uh, we'd like to shout out to Eve Harris, who's joining us, and give Susanna Fox a great question from Lisa Galtieri. What is the difference between crowdsourcing and participatory research? Oh, great question. So I would say that crowdsourcing is part of participatory research. Um, that um, it's, it's participatory research is, is really a big tent. And that's what I found out when I started to research this, this topic. Um, which I actually did at Larry's invitation for Stanford Medicine X. Um, and the more that I started to peel away the onion layers, the more I realized that there's, there's endless layers, endless techniques that you can use in participatory research. Um, like I just had never heard, for example, of photo voice, but it's a technique that there's, um, you can actually do graduate work just on this technique of photo voice. Um, and so crowdsourcing would just be another tool. OK. And so, so participatory research is where you're kind of diving in and pulling information out. Crowdsourcing is where the information is kind of coming together collectively. Is that how you understand it? Yes. Or so some type of participatory research is, is, is the, the philosophy of being open. So the philosophy of saying that, um, again, the respondent, the, the, the people that you're studying are actually at the center of it and are going to tell you how to do the work so that you can better understand their experience, their attitudes, et cetera, instead of being a person who doesn't let anybody participate and see the questions, <laughs> which is traditional research. Just like in, um, like in the class that, that we had at Medicine X, um, there was somebody there who talked about the challenge of having a clinical trial. Um, and a lot of clinical trials fail because they design them you know, not with necessarily patients and caregivers in mind. You know, you need to spend time at home seeing how the medication is actually going to be administered and understand it's really hard for a mom to do this six times a day or whatever the protocol is calling for. Let's understand the context of that family's life and design a protocol that works. Oh my gosh. We've got <laughs> the gaffer on. tape is failing. <laughs> Walking gallery is coming down. <laughs> so Excellent. We'd like to take another, uh, another question from the class. Hi. I, I see some parallels between this beginning of a wave of patient-generated data and what you're talking about when it comes to being open versus the clipboard thing, because patient-generated data is very it's kind of clipboardy. It's like, give me your blood pressure, give me your weight, give me your glucose, but they're not, there's not really room in that conversation in those patient-facing apps, if you will, to, to ask the, the big questions about, is there anything else, essentially? Yeah, exactly. And so it's, it's not really research. It's, it's direct clinical engagement, but it's the same. It seems like it's the same, the same issue. Thank you so much. So, so you, you um, you've made my day. Uh, what I really wanted to do was bring out this idea that the patterns that I'm seeing in participatory research and opening up to the possibility that the respondent has more to share than what they might 
fill out on a yes, no questionnaire is the same relationship that a clinician can have with a patient. Then that is that, that there's, there's not a lot of space in the traditional model for the patient to, to talk you know, in their own words. Um, and I know it's a huge challenge, but I think that there are some interesting possibilities. Um, I'll bring up one, you, since you talked about language, and, and um, it reminds me of something that's happening at patients like me. Um, Sally Oaken talks about how people are, um, people often don't really know how to describe a symptom. And so there's all kinds of ways to describe numbness in their feet or um, you know, a loss of dexterity in their hands. And it's kind of a folk way. It's like there's a folksonomy of describing these symptoms. And so patients like me is actually systematizing this and saying, name all the ways that you would describe your symptoms and let's make sure that that's reflected in our system. And so they're creating this taxonomy of symptoms using what real people, how real people describe it so that then they can you know, sort of type that in and, and sort of get it almost like a Google Translate. So this is what you say to a doctor. So you're describing this, this is the medical term for it, hmm. um, which I think is a neat thing because it, it doesn't have to be the doctor or the nurse standing there trying to figure out what they mean when they say it's this kind of buzzing or this kind of numbness. They have done that homework already and they know how to describe it in clinical terms. Interesting that they're able to connect people even using different terminology then. Okay, fascinating. Uh, we'd like to do a couple of other shout outs here. Hopefully we're not going to offend anyone this time. Um, <laughs> let's see here. I lost my, lost my spot here. Uh, to, oh, never mind. I'm just going to go straight to a question. Okay, uh, from Giles Friedman, how about patient-driven research? Yes, and hi, Jill. Um, Jill, sorry. Um, I offended him. Sorry, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> patient-driven research, I think, is, is actually sort of the third wave of this, that, that um, uh, patients are now um, starting to come up with these ideas for research. Um, that again, if there can be a partnership with the patients, they, expert patients, um, often have better ideas about what the future is actually going to be. Like Brett is a great example where you were able to sort of drive forward your own research. You were N of one. Um, and there's, there's amazing examples of essentially N of one clinical trials, which I would see as an example of patient-driven research. Um, and once I started thinking about N of one clinical trials, um, I started frankly thinking that we're all in an N of one clinical trial at all times, you know, and we're all just, whether we are thinking about it or not, we think about like, well, I slept better last night. Why was that? You know, and, and why do I feel better? Um, and so, um, but then in the clinical setting, when it becomes more serious than just how I slept last night, um, I, think that there's, I think there's a huge possibility and people should be ready for it and open to it. Excellent. And, and uh, so yeah, those shout outs, we're gonna go to mm -hmm. Ravi Nambiar and Nai Nguyen. Thank you for joining us. Do we have time for one more question? All right, we've got time for one more question, then we'll wrap up. Um, I'm sorry, here. Hey. Hi. As a scientist who gathers, oh crap, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. As a scientist who gathers data, how do you reach the other sector of the patient population, like the housebound, severely terminally or chronically ill sector, the people with lupus, um, end-stage cancer, HIV, cardiovascular failure, even myalgic encephalomyelitis? Um, how do you revolutionize the collection of data to reach all the patients? Um, I really liked what you said about crowdsourcing and self-tracking, but like I feel like we still need to reach that sector that doesn't have the energy or the financial resources to even make it to a doctor's visit um, and who are at the end stage of their battle with cancer, you know, all the ones yeah. listed. Thank you so much. So the, the question was about um, thinking about the spectrum of, of uh, the patient population. There's the, there's the well, there's the less well, and all the way at the end are the people who are end stage who 
Um, and, and there's also people who are offline um, because of disability, because of economic, lack of economic resources to be online. Um, the, the ray of hope that I can bring is that we've done a lot of work looking at caregivers. Um, and that if there's somebody in that person's life who is caring for them, then they're very, very likely to be online. Caregivers are among the most um, likely to have internet access and um, they're the most likely to do research and to actually do tracking on behalf of the loved one that they're caring for. But I think that you bring up a really important point that there is going to be a small segment of the population who is cut off from these resources. Um, and uh, frankly, I don't necessarily have an answer for that. If they, if they don't have a caregiver and if they themselves aren't online, then indeed we need to reach out to them because they're not being able to access the wealth of information that's now available. They're, it's, it's like they're stuck still at the information kiosk, you know, at that stage. Thank you so much, Susanna. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> and a shout out, thank you for joining us on Twitter. Please continue the conversation at hashtag MedX. Thank you, Dr. Chu, for having us. That's it. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for this class on participatory research for patient engagement with Susanna Fox and Brett Alder. Please also remember to join us again next week, Thursday, February 13th, 2014, with guest lecturer Daniel Siegel, professor of psychiatry from the University of California, Los Angeles, who will speak to us on the topic, compassion, connection, and engagement how health arises from our mind, body, and relationships. Stanford Medicine X ePatient Scholar Jody Shoger will moderate the discussion. Please also join us next Tuesday, February 11, 2014, at 5.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for another edition of Stanford Medicine X Live. This time we're going to be talking about why should physicians engage. We'll have with us a panel of physician delegates and e-patients who attended our 2013 conference at Stanford Medicine X. We will discuss with them the importance of engagement to them as delegates, what they got out of the conference, and why physicians should consider attending Medicine X. So don't miss that episode of Stanford Medicine X Live next February 11th, 2014 at 5.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. On behalf of Stanford Medicine X, the Stanford AIM Lab, class faculty member myself, Dr. Larry Chu, and Dr. Kyra Bobinette, thanks so much for joining us, and we'll see you next week. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.